This is a Neko Media Podcast. What's your pleasure, sir? Welcome, welcome, cinephiles and cinebites. This is episode 14 of season 3. I'm your host, Anna Kupke. Still recovering from the Halloween festivities in the labyrinth. What a night. As we continue on into November, we have a guest on today's show. A New York filmmaker, Ante Novakovic. See, I didn't butcher his name. He joins us on the show to talk about his most recent horror film, American Fright Fest. He shows what it was like to film in an asylum that was frightful in itself. Ante also gives advice and tips for aspiring filmmakers and drops some notes on his newest projects. What a cool dude. Listen in on our conversation with Ante Novakovic. All right, well, welcome to a new episode of the Cinephiles and Cenobites podcast. I am Anofre, and with me, my hetero life mate, Mox. Say hello. What's up? <laughs> uh, today, we have a guest on the show. We have a writer, director, a director of the, the latest indie horror flick, American Fright Fest. Uh, welcome to the show. American Fright Fest. Ante Novakovic. You did it. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Man. Yeah, yeah. You nailed it. Hell you did yeah. It. Oh, my. I got All it. Right. Look at that. Yes. We're on the list of, of not butchering motherfuckers. Cool. <laughs> and their names. <laughs> right yeah. on. Well, Ante, uh, welcome to the show. Um, feel free to kind of just uh, introduce yourself and maybe give us a little bit background on your um, on your work and um, placement in the film industry. So, yeah, I started... Uh, Started in the industry many years back, probably 20 years back, and started for the last five up to six years doing uh, more of my own work, creating content, filming independent films, short films, you name it. I've done it all, a few pilots at this point. Uh, oh, wow. And uh, yeah, I've been creating some screenplays, horror screenplays, and it checks into a hotel, truck stop. Uh, American Fright Fest has been the uh, has been the on the leaderboard for a while, so that's something that's come to fruition mm. uh, recently. Yeah, let's get into your latest project. Yeah, American Fright Fest. The original title was just Fright Fest, right? Yeah, it was so. Yeah, the original title was Fright Fest. Uh, that's how it all started. That's the title that was started with. I uh, came on board. It was a screenplay written by Robert Gillings. Uh, I came on board during the development phase. Uh, it was always titled Fright Fest. I think one of the companies that picked it up for distribution uh, retitled it uh, to American Fright Fest mm. for reasons beyond my comprehension. But I'm I'm fine. I mean, you yeah. know, I think it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's one of those decisions like <laughs> gets made in the independent world where like company comes in picks up and it's like well you know i'm happy it's american fry fest and not like pitchforks and and chainsaws or something like that like <laughs> right. you know what i'm saying like right, right, been, like right. way oh. out of the purview of being like what well, i have no idea what that's about like what what so <laughs> this day at least it stayed within you know <laughs> they put a locale on top of it, sure, so sure. i'm okay with that yeah oh, okay i like that example of what they could have came at you with yeah, I mean, it could have went anywhere, right? right. So it's like, it's like, okay, I'm, that's cool. At least they stayed in that, you know. Yeah. They could have named it Butterflies and Bats or something weird, like, you know, who knows? You know? Abandoned Asylum. So, if you had a great idea for a title. Exactly, yeah. right? And I'm scratching my head going, what okay, the? Massacre. Yeah, right. where is that selling? I don't sure. know. What market is that? Well, what was the pitch, yeah. like? When he came up to you, like we're gonna have to change his title. Like, what was? Can we ask, like, the reason? Not really. No, I think that I think they. Just, I don't. You know, again, <laughs> I'd love to ask these guys. I would truly wish I had more of an answer. I truly don't know their algorithm. Like all these companies have algorithms, that, you know, they do their research, and you know, they they know more than us. I I think it's Terminator stuff. I think they're robots running the world and they know more than us. And, <laughs> there's some justification. You know what I'm saying? We just, mm. There's some, there's right. some, One, you know what I'm saying? Some, 
<laughs> yeah, like A being the first letter in the alphabet. I don't know how any of that works, man. I just oh yeah, yeah. Right, that's true. Weird no, enough. you know what? That's a, that's a good that's a, that's a good point, right? Because now anything it'll show up early on just a random search list if they go on to Time or whatever streaming service, right? They hit the A. No, we just we just we just broke the code. Yeah. We're probably all gonna like disappear magically somehow. Because we just broke the code. Yeah. They're like, they know. They know. They listen to this podcast. They're so like, they know they're done. That's it. Yeah. Get rid of them. <laughs> we know the secrets. We know how it's done now. Then we know. Market a movie. We know the marketing chain. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Right on. So, yeah, I think um, Ono was asking um, where was, I guess, uh, the location and maybe where was it set? Because that did not look like uh, New York, which I know you're. No. That's like. No, yeah, I'm based out of New York, New York filmmaker. But no, that was a uh, location was uh, Penhurst Asylum. Uh, it's a, it's an actual asylum that was closed. I, I believe it was shut down in the early '80s, or late '80s, like mid '80s, something like that. '85. Wow. Um, located outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, more in the rural setting. I think it's like an hour and a half outside of uh, Philly, um, and uh, it's it's. A privately owned property now that is used as an actual haunt, like a fest. Mm. People come to every year, and it's it's called the Penthouse Asylum, and uh, oh, that's the location cool. we shot at. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> we didn't really have to do that much <laughs> to make it. Um, wow, it exactly right. Yeah, yeah, it was it was now, really. Yeah. I, I know you. Uh, they brought you on during development. What um, I guess what part of the script kind of spoke to you that you wanted to tell this story uh it was the thing that got me more than anything was the irony you know the twist which you know in one sense you know it's kind of i think it's it's been emulated i think in a few films now i'm seeing like hellfest and blood i'm like what is this the year of <laughs> like all this like all these best, all these like, films right yeah right well all this like all of a sudden people become real um that part of it appealed to me like it was you know the whole irony of here you have b-level i want a b-horror film director a cult classic director let's say he's probably done two or three mm -hmm. cult like you know amazing films in his career that he's kind of lived off of for the last 10 15 20 going into maybe 30 years mm -hmm. but nothing relevant currently you know and all of a sudden he winds up in right. a situation where he's trying to do this thing that he doesn't really want to do and the irony of a real horror taking place under this guy's watch became like the irony became a little too, too great to ignore the kind of comedy in it in one sense. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say it. So there was a factor of the comedy and like, how crazy would that be? <laughs> you know, like, you know, like right. now he's kind yeah. of orchestrating this real life horror movie. And I feel like he kind of devolves into it. He, he goes a bit mad. Yeah, as director of this real life tragedy um, <laughs> massacre kind of unfolding, the idea of the killer, where did that come from? That was probably, other than the gore, that was my favorite part. I mean, that dude is just badass. Like, yeah. I think he said Terminator earlier. Um, <laughs> fucking, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's straight, like, oh shit, you know, he's got the cool yeah. ass mask. He's yeah. packed up. He's definitely got the appeal. Yeah, I think I, that, that, that is Jonathan Camp came on to play the part of Ruben um, and yeah he's tremendous and I think that whole the idea of the killer really kind of evolved it was kind of put in as an individual that was part of um, part of this uh, psych transfer uh, that they were doing from a state mental facility to another facility and obviously that gets intervened and they wind up at the Fry Fest but kind of like the underlying his underlying storyline or what he uh, what he embodies is someone that was a kid at that facility earlier on in life. Right, we got a so sense. He of knows him. that place. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of depth to like, I don't know, like, you know, a certain way. You know, this director's cut. You know, there's cuts. You know, uh, there was probably more of it in the director's cut where we got into the fact that he was, you know, a. Not only was he you know, escaping and coming to this place. He's kind of coming home. Sure. He's there sure. as a kid. Right, right. He's a product 
of this place. Exactly. Kind of, right? Yeah. He was a product of that specific facility. That's kind of why, that's where the mass comes from. That's what, you know. Yeah. So there was a much deeper backstory. We kind of, I really wanted to develop that and give him some underpinning because I felt like, you know, we just, yeah. if you just have a guy come in with, you know. Right, nothing, right. Yeah. So it was really sense. like, yeah, it was more focused on that. Oh, okay. So you would say yeah. the original idea was, because um, I think that's w- one point we brought up in our review was, um, mm-hmm. so who is, whose eyes are we looking through in this film? Like who, like, so it feels like it's, it's him, right? Ruben's character. Yeah, it is him. It's partially. I think it's almost like three people. I would say. I think you kind of we're, we're sharing, sharing the scope, and it was a good yeah. point, you know. Yeah. And I felt like the like I'm going to reference the director's cut every once in a while. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. No problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was a bit longer. Than yeah. like that, so, right. So maybe some of that would have been a little bit more enlightening. But you know, it's an hour and a half. And whatnot. Again, you know, Luke Bain's character. We had a bit more of his backstory yes, kind of yeah. like dealing with the fact there's a few things that were in there that that we had uh shot that like we kind of delve into why we might believe he wasn't the one mm. and how maybe these two guys are related so there's a lot in that uh and spencer crow as well we see it through his eyes in one sense as a spectator you know All right, I right mean, yeah, sure. an opportunity you know an opportunist let's put it that way sure um so it's like a collective there's three of them that we see those are the points of view that were kind of, I would say, those are the most honed characters in the mm. piece. Yeah, Dylan Walsh was, um, his character was really nutty in this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Was like, Whoa, how many drugs do you need, yo? <laughs> and he's downing people. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, I was kind of like keeping the count. I was like, where is he now? Like, I think we did do like a diagram of. You know, we kind of spaced it out. Like, okay, if you've had that many beers, you have to do a bump like yeah. to get back up again and oh, right, drink right. X amount to bring mm-hmm. it down. Like, keep that. I mean, in whatever stasis that is, to keep that equilibrium going. Sure. So sure. we kind of oh, wow, <laughs> at one yeah. point, I think we lost track. You know, we were like, <laughs> how much did he? <laughs> are you on uppers now? Yeah. What are you taking now? <laughs> Mushrooms? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. We were um, like, wait, how, what is he on? You know. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, he devolves into, you know, I mean, this is this pole gig is is an opportunity for him to avoid doing like roadside cleanup sure, in sure. Malibu, probably. You know, oh right, <laughs> like a month. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, he's, he's not exactly the uh, the bastion of uh, of uh, of moral fiber or uh, moral right. Yeah, you know, he, he's he got issues, tremendous mm. issues, and a lot of them have to do with drugs, and, uh, you know, so he kind of devolves, you know, goes right back to it. <laughs> As things go bad, <laughs> he's just, uh, on, he's on, back to square one. I, I feel like, um, well, one, I guess one question is, who made the decision to make all of these cuts? Because I feel like the director's cut you're talking about mm-hmm. really fleshes it more out of, of kind of a character-driven genre film as opposed to what shows up as, like, you know, like you said, a sleek 90-minute kill fest. Like, yeah. um, who made the decision to kind of cut out all of this character stuff? Because I feel like that is the movie that people should see, even if it is, what, you know, 120 minutes or however long the... Your vision yeah, I mean, it's, it's like been. another 10, 15, 20 minutes, maybe tops. I believe it's probably another 15 minutes or something like that. Um, I don't know, you know, it's like it, go, it went through its phases, you know, and it's like mm. once you complete it, you know, the yeah. uh, producers and you know, companies buying and selling the film, sure. all that stuff starts to become part of the process that's like unavoidable, yeah, you know. So, oh, I, as an independent right, filmmaker, right. I respect it, I understand, I'm not trying to, you know. Is what it is, you yeah. know, but, right? Right, right. You know, um, you know, but there's certain moments and beats that you know I feel like probably give a little bit more texture to the piece in certain areas, you know, sure. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, so in that regard, but I think decisions are made down the line, like much after, you know, I've, I've done my thing and been a part of it. I think you know it goes into other hands, and you know, the name okay. becomes American Fry Fest and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, were you um there during the edits, like when the film was being pieced together? Yes, I was there for the first part of the I was there for the first run through of edits. 
uh, wasn't there for this for the next bunch of edits. Um, mm. So I think like that's where things started to change. And, you know, that, I mean, like I said, I'm happy with the film. I'm not, you know, I yeah. would ne- you know, it, it's right, right. something that I worked on, you know, and so, you know, I'm not knocking at it at all. I think sure. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really good horror film, but I think, you know, for me right. as well, it's like, I, you know, tend to delve into character and want to you know, explore see. a little bit more, take a little more time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like, I feel where you're coming from, you know, despite having your own vision of it, you really don't sound like you resent that someone else had another vision that ended up, you know, being what got distributed. And I think that's so cool, man. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, you know, you know, I understand the, 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 you know, all parts of it, you know what I'm saying? Because, mm-hmm. you know, making a, it's, it's not individual to a certain degree, and there's a lot of different parts that come into play, so you kind of have to accept sometimes that these are things that happen, you know, along the, along the route. And uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff done, but, you know, it's, yeah, just there's a few scenes you fall in love with that you go, oh. <laughs> it's like, right. you know. Yeah, you're, like, hey, you're darlings, yeah. Exactly. Well, just yeah. very, very classy, dude. Um, because it just springs to mind, I don't know the director's name, but he did the latest iteration of Fantastic Four. And on okay. his opening day, he Twitter blasts you know, basically saying that the studio ruined his film, kind of having a 140 character fucking uh, tantrum. Like, wow, dude. <laughs> nah, I mean, you can't listen. Like, you know, like, I, that's A, not my style. B, I wouldn't, like, I can't look at the film and say, oh, it's, no, it's actually really a good film. I've gotten, like, great feedback. People, it's like, you know, and I actually am a fan of it, too. I mean, it's just, you know, but I wouldn't, I can't knock it at all. I mean, I'd give it nothing but right, a thumbs right. up, you know. For everyone's working as well, oh, yeah, and the crew sure. and everyone, you know, it's like a lot of people oh, work yeah. on these things. You know? A lot of hard work. Right. A lot of hard work goes into it. You know, I mean, look, like cinematographer Matt yeah. Jaffe, uh, Steve Breslin, one of the grips, uh, lighting, all that stuff. I mean, there's lots of people that work on this thing, you know, to make it come to life, and um, you know, it becomes a uh, it becomes a group effort you know, you sure. respect everyone's role in it you know? i'm not you know I, I i never walk into a room and feel like okay i'm here i'm i'm the reason you know it's like no there's a whole bunch of people here sure, sure. you know showing up every day <laughs> you know you're working with that are like making this happen you know and it's like the crew is so incredibly important uh, and there, there was an amazing crew on this like through and through that everyone yeah shut up with their A game and, and, and you know work really hard on it. So and the actors as well. Okay. well Dylan Walsh you, you just stay high. You just need to do that. Just do it. keep <laughs> keep downing keep all the <laughs> keep, keep stay his character. In character. <laughs> yeah right. That was my dad. yeah I was like, <laughs> right, like right. Uh, yeah <laughs> <Stay>. <laughs> yeah exactly I was yeah. <laughs> yeah I was like pineapple express right. all the way. Just go for it. You know like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, just so, do it. Um, how long was the pre-production? Um, you know, how long did you get to, uh, I guess, work on building this world and rehearse the actors and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So that got a little tight, like, because it's independent. You know, uh, again, the independent structure of it. You know, um, that wasn't a lot of upfront time. I mean, I got together with some of the heads of the department earlier, uh, but cast, mm-hmm. cast wasn't there till like just a few days before, just like we were going into it. Oh, wow. Uh, so there's a lot of trust there, a lot of trust. Sure. Um, and they were all, you know, super professional. It's just made it, you know, easier. I go in and block with them, you know, kind of in the empty space, no, no crew, nobody in this space and kind of work through the scenes with them. And, and uh, you know, they kind of, like I said, they were all of them being professional really helped and, uh, you know, kind of getting the gist of what we were going after. So it made things move uh, seamlessly. But, you know, I credit that to everyone being a professional. I kind of wouldn't, <laughs> I'd be very afraid of an amateur bunch, like not really, you know, knowing what to do. But everyone was like well-versed. Nice. So we we're able to get to it quickly. It wasn't a tremendous amount of, I think we did one table read. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I talked to the actors quite a bit about their characters, met with them individually, one-on-one, um, had nice long conversations, and uh, 
we jumped into it head oh. first. Nice. Mox, yeah. um, I got to ask my one nice. question. I know. Okay. I know. I was just about to beat you to it. <laughs> go for it. Go. Uh, Ante, <laughs> um, I guess it's kind of a two-parter. One, sure. uh, how important is storyboarding in uh in the, the pre-production phase of a film and two did you do any of it <laughs> okay so yes and yes yes uh, yes okay. incredibly important oh, nice. yes and yes i do horrible stick figure storyboarding oh, okay, um, okay. <laughs> and i have deep and meaningful conversations with the dp oh, okay. uh, and i mean my job here myself would sit and go over tones colors ideas setups um you know, Dutch angles, like this scene might require a Dutch angle. We can get it mm. from the, you know, the, like we mapped out, I would say a majority of what we were going to do. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's incredibly important because I, it, I mean, it depends, it depends on what you're doing. I mean, I, I sure. think you could be a lot looser with the more experimental piece probably uh, and not kind mm. of, you know, have a set that you don't really need to kind of lock things in. But this was 17 days. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> wow, 17 days. Yeah, we shot in 17 days. Yeah, we shot this in 17 wow. days. And uh, we were doing like, let's see, six scenes a day, six or seven scenes a day. Wow. So we had to kind of book wow. these. We had to, okay, yeah, that's right. where it becomes important, I think. I think the storyboarding becomes really important. Yeah. And when you're moving at that, you know, I, I, I would I'd be freaked out if I didn't <laughs> I would be sweating a lot every day if I didn't kind of map things out. Sure. Um so yeah. Okay. Wow. Cause yeah, like when the tour starts in the movie, like everyone's exploring these different rooms. Did you film yeah. all of that like on separate days? Like, okay, now this is gonna be the the scene where the mayor gets his his brain's fried. Okay, we're gonna film this, and then like you, you spent like a day like focused on one particular room of the asylum. Uh not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. What we well, what we did is we. I mean, we did our tech scouts and all that kind of stuff, and we walked the the, the facility uh, a few times uh, with you know heads of department, uh, set design, DC, yeah, grip scaffold stuff like that. And as we're going through, we're marking off like possible for death of, you know, this be a good room to, you know, mayor, this be a good, good space for, you know, the group coming together, this be a great space for Mercy Malik's character to mm. have the conversation about, you know, the head psychiatrist and the, uh, his wife murdering him. Mm. You know, so right. as we were going through the space and kind of looking at it from technical and you know, every other possibility as well as like if we shoot down that hallway and we have to move all like <laughs> three <laughs> floors up, you know what I'm saying? Like that's gonna be that's gonna kill everybody. As opposed to is there something on this landing we might be able to find that'll match. You know, so it's part math, part visual, part, you know, it all kind of starts to come together and become very real. Sure. You know, because like when you turn around and you tell like Two grips to be carrying a seven hundred pound dolly on the staircase. <laughs> they don't. Oh, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're yeah, like, yeah. You carry it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Like, so, um, so it becomes a lot of that, you know. Um, so the different spaces become, uh, you know, we kind of again mapped out as much as we could pre-production. Sure. Oh wow. Okay. Nice. Mm. Was uh, the writer Robert Gillian no, did, on set? Oh not much. Not much. He came for one day. He was actually in the film. He played an officer. Okay, okay. It gets, uh, he plays the officer at the at the car. He's there for one day. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. He came by. Yeah, yeah. He came by that day to get. I think he was in. He was yes. He was actually he played an officer. In it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. He was by set once. Oh, okay. Okay. In the shoot. Sure. Yeah. Can you describe your, I guess, your approach to filmmaking and directing in a particular uh, for any, you know, would be filmmakers out there? And how, how do you approach each script or each project? Well, first, like, find something you love about the project. That's, I mean, a script has to, like, jump up and grab you. Mm -hmm. There has to be some, right. something about it that kind of, 
you feel you can bring some insight to or have an idea you want to kind of explore or expand upon, like get some depth going with it. Um, as far as filmmaking, I really kind of get as many, you know, um, I would say collaborate with as many professionals as you can. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, find a team, find a team that really cares about what they do individually in their like, in their title, you know, whether it's set design, wardrobe, makeup, mm-hmm. yeah, sound, like you work with the team that really cares because ultimately they won't fail you. You won't fail them. Um, and, it's, and I say that only because it's super collaborative. And if you can try to work with them as much as you can on every project, <laughs> yeah. you only get better, sure. you know, and, you know, care about the, your actors, try and create as safe a space for them as possible. Like, nice. you know, the day gets crazy when you're on set. Um, try to create as nurturing an environment for them to feel safe enough to explore so that they know you have their back. So that when they go out and, they, you know, try to do something, they know that you're supporting mm-hmm. them. Yeah. What kind of uh, environment or atmosphere, I guess, do you like to create? I know uh, space creative wise, but um, I've heard of some directors, especially in heavy genre, they try to make it more creepy or more to match the tone of the film itself. Do you, is that how you, your creative process? Uh, or, you know? uh, you, I think you got to cast well, you know what I'm saying? Like that, it, to a certain degree, I mean, like in this, in this case, like in certain, another case, it'd probably be different. We'd have to explore different ways of getting there. But like, let's say in this case, we had an abandoned asylum, but if you walked down a long hallway, I didn't have to scare you. <laughs> you have to like, if you were physically in that space, you were like, I mean, we're all huddled together as a crew uh, because I don't think anyone really wanted to get left behind at, at like a different spot within the facility because they'd be like crying basically, you know, like it had that effect on right. people. It was really like, it was a scary place. So <laughs> I didn't have to like, you know, um, kind of use any tactics, I guess, in a way sure. to create a creepy vibe. Right, right. Uh, it already kind of, you know, every day another story was coming out, you know, from the crew, from the yeah. cast about some interaction they feel they had with <laughs> a spirit or <laughs> with so, around. yeah. It sounds know, like I the mean, location was really giving the giving tree almost, right? It's oh, yeah. I mean, so for example, like Luke Baines ordered a pizza on one night, uh, but he told me about it a week after. He ordered a pizza. He's like, in between, we were shooting late night, and the delivery guy wouldn't come onto the grounds. He had to go all the way to the gate, which good half mile. So I had to drive him to the gate to get to oh, pay the guy. Dang. The guy wouldn't come onto the grounds, and Luke said, "Well, why wouldn't he come onto the grounds?" And he said, "I had family that worked at this place when it was open." And he said, "So," and he goes, "I won't go in there." Damn. And then he walked away. Never explained why. Here's a pizza. But no context yet. <laughs> Good <this> place is... <laughs> Yeah. Right? Here's your pizza. Uh, Here's your I'm, pizza. I ain't, uh, I ain't stepping on those guys. I'm like thinking. <laughs> Here's a couple of Hail Marys and a prayer. Good luck. <laughs> right. So like, you, I mean, just you get to fill in the blank, right? So what yeah. that is, we don't know. Right. right? And then we always have people film. on set that actually, you know, know the facility, know the history. And they were always offering, do you want me to tell you a story of like, you know, they were always asking me, do you want me to tell you a story of like what, what happened here? And, this and, that? and I used to tell them, no, I don't want to hear anything until I'm out of here. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I, really don't want, I really don't want to know because yeah. I'll probably never be able to finish yeah. this film. I'll be like, I can't get you like, just give me a quick example. The first time I went there and walked the grounds, the tunnels underneath, we had, you know, a tech scout, all this stuff. And we're, we're going through for some reason. I don't know. I don't know the facility. I've never been there before. I have them in a flashlight and they're like, I'm up front. So it's like people are following me and I'm like going, you know, <laughs> I've never been to this place. I don't have a facility. And I scan my flashlight left. And at the end of this long haul is one of those like old British type porcelain dolls hanging from a string oh in a room. 
right? And that's all you need, right? Like just random, <laughs> random, <laughs> random doll hanging from the string. <laughs> and they were like, "Which way should we go?" And I went the other opposite. I went, "Let's go right." I stayed away from that left side because I was like, "I can't." There's no way. Like that's Annabelle. I don't know what that right, like. Right. I was like, right. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, but creepy random doll hanging from a string. <laughs> random porcelain British cracked face doll hanging from a string. Like I was like, are you kidding me? Like, Did someone put that this? there? I mean, please, really, like seriously. Really you know, <laughs> and these are tunnels. These are tunnels that connect all the buildings at the facility. So there was like this inherent, and people, you know, oh. Fife Fest, they go through this whole joint. Yeah. Halloween, so it's you didn't really need to <laughs> make sure you have your vaccinations, we had. you know. <laughs> Don't yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seriously, <laughs> seriously. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Going back to crew, because um, I know the the dynamic that you said is so important that you know you trust them and they trust you. Um, yeah. Do you work with the same crew with all of your pictures? Uh, with this your same crew, or uh, um, you try, you try. This wasn't the same crew I work with on a lot of pictures. They happen to be a great crew to work with, uh, so I kind of got lucky with that. Right. Um, you, but you try. I mean, I try to work with the same people because, I mean. They, they continue working and it doesn't always work out. Some people work on other things. You're working on something else and, you know, mm -hmm. schedules don't meet up. But, you know, they're, they're refining their process. You're refining your process. And when you're together, it just kind of deepens. The best way I can put it. It's funny that, that that previous question you brought up, Mox, about, like, the tactics, like how to kind of um, work with the actors. And in, in, in the film, they brought oh, yeah, yeah. they reference oh, there's this one filmmaker who actually used a loaded gun to motivate yeah. the actors. Yeah. Like, no, no, he, he didn't do that, did he? No, <laughs> no. No, I heard that. That's from, um, who was that? That was in The Exorcist, I believe. Oh, wow, okay. That's that, fam that's that famous sure. story, I believe. It was in The Exorcist or one of the others. I've, I, I've heard that famous story of, like, he fired off a live round. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like thinking my luck I'd probably hit someone but oops okay that was my career oh, you know man. I mean it's <laughs> you know what I'm saying like I don't know about that you sure, know sure. I mean you know this is, but, but I've heard stories of um, you know so I kind of just thought it was funny like you know to kind of throw that in you know uh, as an example like because there was a few people that had done stuff that was pretty extreme that I heard of mm. and uh, you know sometimes it could pay off I mean, sometimes you can, mm -hmm. you can huh. catch a bullet. Uh, <laughs> right. so, How far right. do you want to go? <laughs> right. Oh, my God. That's crazy. You know, um, yeah. So the reception has been generally positive or overwhelmingly oh, yeah. positive. Um, did you, was, what was the end picture? Trying to get it distributed and sold or festivals first? Uh, it kind of happened at the same time. Uh, a festival, I think the Fight Fest, uh, London Film Festival, uh, kind of came right at the point where it was getting sold. Kind of happened right at the same time. So that kind of like lined up, you know, perfectly. Uh, and so I don't think we, we were going to any more festivals than that, though, like some festivals started coming in and asking, like, hey, do you want to be a part of it? Do you want, you know, which I was kind of excited because horror festivals are tremendous and you get these amazing fans right. but it kind of went straight into distribution so it was a festival basically and then distribution was right there oh wow nice yeah right. oh, okay yeah which is always good i mean yeah. listen like you want i mean i, I as, a, as a director i don't know if there's anyone out there that doesn't want to find an audience to some degree you know right, right. <laughs> like, right. it's like nah not really. Yeah, you do, of course. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, what are you telling? I mean, yeah. now it can. Yeah, you know, you're right. making home movies. I don't know if that's about home um, videos, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> so yeah, I think you know, distribution's tremendous. Thankful for it. Nothing but gratitude. That's now, sweet. what's next on the horizon? You got anything lined up, or you're just kind of taking a break, or is there some story you're dying to tell next? 
Well, there is a story. I wrote a screenplay titled Man Checks Into a Hotel, which is a horror film, uh, another horror feature. Uh, it kind of gets into this familial situation of this father with the so obsessive compulsive gambler gets into serious debt can't pay can't pay the the back end on a, a debt he owes and you know uh, winds up having to give up his heart for transplant surgery in order to save his family uh so it takes a bad turn obviously wow. oh. right um pretty high stakes and uh gets himself into the situation there's a twist that gets him to kind of renegotiate <laughs> at this hotel where they're supposed to have the surgery and uh, it takes off from there. So it's kind of this quasi, that's way I can put it, is a quasi kind of like thriller, horror, organ donor situation. Yeah. Yeah, that just ratchets and gets bloodier. And I, I like that because it's kind of a twist, right, on that whole um, yeah. uh, uh, fucking dirty, pretty things, those hotels where, you know, you fall yes. asleep, you wake up, you're missing an organ. Uh-huh. Like, this guy is kind of checking himself into that, and then it kind of goes from there. I also really like the title, Man, Man Checks into, into a Hotel. Yeah, it was a weird one. I told a few people. Dot, 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 almost. Right? It's kind of like, I, I find it somewhere, live somewhere between, like, the beginning of a joke or a story. Man checks into a hotel and right, it's kind of like Yeah. Oh nice. so, right, yeah, right. Dot, dot, you, dot, dot, dot. yeah, so like, all right. Yeah. yeah. So let's see. I, and I, I like that's interesting, dude. Um are you so you have you finished the script or you're still developing yeah. it? The script's or done the script's it? complete completed, done, finished. It's um it's fine. It's where I've recruited a few distribution companies so far, so it's in a good place, um, you know, financing and hopefully it'll start to come together and it'll be up and running and I'll be able to shoot it soon. Nice, nice. Is there any advice you give to upcoming uh, filmmakers, screenwriters, or directors on how to, I guess, put projects together so that they can get their voice or vision out into the world? Um, best advice I give, again, is always have to have a great team team you love to work with like find people that are really good at what they do within like if you're at a, a film school or you working with other people that are just starting in the industry find people that are passionate care and then find stories that you can actually tell like you can do as opposed to mm-hmm. you know i every once in a while i'll kind of work on projects i'll rewrite and kind of work on a few things side jobs and stuff like that and like really big big stories and i'm going are you going to be actually able to fund this, do this kind of thing, like in the real world, like for, you know, a lower budget. And, you know, I'd always right. say, try to find something you can do. that's really interesting without a crazy budget, you know, put your time and energy into developing, you know, the story character um, and a twist, you know, because I mean, short films are great. Short films are a great way to get, you know, bang for the buck like really tell a great story not have it be like a crazy budget but show that you have the skill set to do it sure yeah Yeah, and i think if you make a few killer short films you'll be on your way nice you know people be like they know what they're doing sure sure yeah the short film route nice (laughs) uh yeah it's suggested only because you know it's like you go out there and you make a feature film everyone wants to make a feature it's like just be on a set with people, do a short film, do a short film really well, do a few of them, get your, you know, confidence, get your feet underneath you, you start to know how everything works, develop from that, and then, like, you're ready to go into your feature film, you know, because I, I think if you jump straight in, you, a lot of questions that you get to answer doing short films won't have been answered, and you kind of kind of find yourself you know, mm-hmm. trying to keep that above water at a, at a lower at a lower stage, yeah. Before you jump into the deep end, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you can always, and plus two, I think you can always take a feature project and kind of squeeze it to its like essence, and just do a short. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, just just fill the essence, shoot that, build your skill and experience. Also, that probably, um, like you were saying, it helps to show that these people know what they're doing. They are trustworthy of 
money and delivery. Yeah. And you got your calling card. Like you're able to tell people like, and then you're able to just turn around and say like, look, I have this feature, but I have to show up based on it. So this is what it sounds like, what it like, feels like, you know, take a look at that. And based upon that, people be like, well, I really like it. You know, or, you know what I'm saying? Like you could find financing mm-hmm. that way as opposed to right, right. putting a script in front of you. <laughs> Scripts are hard, you know, just, <laughs> it, it all depends. You know, people, if they're going to read them, if they, you know, there's a you know right. there's a little thing to that. They might watch a short film. True. Less investment, maybe a more powerful emotional response than having to sit down and kind of read. I agree. <laughs> so could you give um an idea of if someone's starting from zero, what would be the kind of money they're looking at to gather or throw down to do a decent short that can serve as a calling card or a springboard? telling larger stories if you're at a school i would say use the production use that production facility for all it's worth like if you're at, literally at, if you're at a film school and you have access to the production equipment and you have crew like mm-hmm. knock it out like you use it like you know they're probably renting you like equipment at like a ridiculously low, low price or probably not even a price like you get a time slot to take it out so i would use the hell out of that to develop material you can always get you know you can always get equipment you know uh at reduced rates if you're a student as well outside you know from production houses and you come in and say hey i'm a film student that kind of thing you can always do that but rates vary you know it depends on what what city you're in depends on you know where you are in the world but you can you know i mean look i'd say you know, if you could get, you know, anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars, depending on the material, you can probably wind up with something really sharp and crisp. You do it for less than that, great. You know, but like, you, can, you know, if you want something that's like really kind of solid, crisp, professional standard, you probably make that happen. Especially now too, with like all right. the possibilities, editing software and all that stuff, like. If you have a good eye and, you know, you know what you're doing, you can make something, you know, super polished. Sure. That'll catch the eye and attention of people. <laughs> right on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ante, so we, we've come to the part of the show where we're going to have to put you on the spot even more. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if we could please get a top six list of your favorite films of all time. <sighs> <laughs> any genre. Any genre. genre. Any any genre. Any. Okay. So it's your top six any, favorite. Okay. Top six. Top six favorite. Yeah. Okay. Any order. Any uh, okay. I'm gonna throw any order. Okay. Let's say okay, so I'm gonna have to throw some coffee during there, right? So oh. I'm gonna say I mean it, it hurts me to say sing and not say Christine. I'm gonna use those as oh, I'm gonna wow. use those as one film maybe. Sure, sure. Sing Christine. Wow. Thank uh, you, Christine. In Christine, I mean, come, you yeah. know, both of them, I think for me, it kind of resonated in a way. It's like, so those, uh, I'm going to have to say, I mean, it's Stanley Kubrick again, huge fan, right? Uh, who isn't? Um, I'm going to have to say Barry Lyndon and Space Odyssey 2001. Wow. Those okay. two count as one. I'm going to count them as one. So we're up to two. Sure. Uh, I'm going to jump in and say, geez, where I go, Martin Scorsese. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I am a New Yorker, grew up here. Yeah. Main Streets. I have to jump in and say Main Streets. Um, I do the right thing by Spike Lee. I'm giving too much to the New Yorkers now. I can also, <laughs> <laughs> I can also jump in and say, without a doubt, and like my foreign side, foreign films that I love, 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 one of my all times, it's going to sound weird, but, but Dolce Vita, and I think that's a Fellini. Um, really? Yeah, it's, it's kind it's, of weird kind of weird and, you know but it's a black and white beautiful film and Eckberg and Marcello Mastriani who I think is one of the, one of like if you watch Italian cinema it's like you know like a star before there were stars in a real in a real kind of way like that guy just anyway mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. you know it's, I gotta throw in some films I've recently seen like uh, uh we are never really there with Joaquin Phoenix recently oh mm-hmm. uh, you yeah, know I film? haven't seen that yet, but I wanted to. Yeah, it looks great. It's amazing. It's amazing. Like, 
I just okay. think, and uh, I'm going to forget her name, female director, and The Piano by Jane Campion. Yes! <laughs> Jane Campion. That is my favorite film Ju- of all time. I know this is going to sound so wrong, and I'm a hard, like I'm making horror films, but like it, everything inspires you. Like I don't think you have to kind of like kind of like really mm-hmm. refine it down like dwindle down it's like oh yeah it has to get okay so like yeah of course evil dead all that stuff like of course like yeah, of course yeah. right, right. Right. halloween yes 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 all of it like for me the horror films are classic it's like tremendous like and i love them uh but you know like kind of mixes for me you know i get a little information from that a little information from this but yeah so i think Somewhere in there, we found our list. Yeah, I'm yeah. gonna remember so yeah. much stuff after we go. Like, ah, damn it! Say, right, right. Um, <laughs> everybody does. Everybody does. Right? Um, like it's crazy. Okay, so Deer Hunter, Taxi Driver. I said it. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, goodbye. Yeah. The no, Raging Bull. Jesus <laughs> Christ! Like, no, 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 okay. <laughs> right. Go on, go on. Oh. Saying it real fast. So uh, I gotta take one um, of the Muppet movies to me as well. Okay, <laughs> yeah, go on. The uh, the director for You Were Never you, Really you know, Here is uh, hearing... Lindsay Ramsey. Or Lynn Ramsey, sorry. Lindsay, Lynn Ramsey, yes. Lynn Ramsey, yes. Really, I mean, like, like that, I guess, kind of like semi-horror in a, weird, in a really bizarre yeah. way. It's I only like seen um, Morvan, Morvan Kalar. That, that's the only one I've seen of her. I don't know if you recognize. That's the one with uh, Samantha Morton. Um, huh. Like, I think that was one of her earlier Never heard ones. of it. Yeah. Um, one of our early ones. Huh. Yeah. Well, okay. it's 2002. Yeah. Okay. So, but um, that oh, one wow. was kind of. Well, the trailer says it all. It's like more of more, Samantha Morton's character is like, I think her husband killed herself and like left his work. And now oh she's... yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know that one. Yeah. I know that one. It's like she's out in the desert somewhere. Yeah. Like, it's, it's kind of. Yeah, I, rem- I remember that one. It's kind of a Bizarre. weird. Time. Yeah, it was very unusual. You can't stop watching it. Sure. For sure. Sure. Yeah, Marvin. Um, and just Marvin. like another another female director that I don't know if you guys saw, Revenge. When you get a chance. Oh, I've I've heard the hype and um like I I keep seeing trailers for it. Like you gotta watch this. I'm like, okay, well I'll get yeah, to yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Revenge. Now that we've spoken about, it, I, got I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm thinking of the same Revenge movie. I'm thinking Kim Costner in like the fucking early '90s, late '80s. Oh, Probably no, not no. the film, right? No, this is more, Which one? more recent. No, okay. No, this was more recent. Sure this is not the yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This is like I think it's a French film. Right? <laughs> but yeah, oh, it's more okay. recent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so I much for your time. I am anxious to see man checks into a hotel, dude. I yeah. mean, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to see a lot of your influences kind of play out within this story device and this genre. I mean, fuck. It sounds like something really unique and fucking layered. Thank you, brother. I look forward to it, and you guys will be the first interview. Yes. That's it. Done. Hell right. yeah. I'm going to write that down. Hell <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love talking to you. Right on, right on. Cool, man. Well, yeah, thank you for staying up late to do this. I re- really appreciate yeah, your time. Yeah, thank you very much. So enjoyable, man. You guys, let me tell you, fun talking to you about tremendous energy. Oh, and sure. I can tell you about like, film fans, which is huge. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, brother. Have a have a good rest of your uh, night. Yeah, and, have a good one, Auntie. Yep. And uh, good luck to you and all your we'll success you with the movie. Yeah, for sure. Thank you yeah. very much, guys. Definitely. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right. Cool, man. All right, brother. All right. Take care, man. See you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Well, that is it for this episode. Uh, thank you for checking it out. Be sure to check out this episode's show notes for links to all our <laughs> social media sites. But other than that, be sure to visit... <laughs> Our website, necomedia.com. That's N E K K O media.com. Dot com. And we also be on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, very active on both of those. And you can check those out at cynical underscore mass. That's C I N E C A L underscore M A S S. And feel free to get in touch through email cinephiles and cinebytes at gmail.com. Any movie recommendations? We'd love to check it out. Any screeners? Any screeners? We'd love to review. Any potential guests? Yeah, we love having guests on the show, too. Yeah, if you're a filmmaker, fucking hit us a line, and we'll get you on the show. A fellow... Ask you your top six movies and what it's like to be an artist like you. Oh, yes. And uh, any fellow cinephiles and cinebites. You are welcome. Yes. 
Any place that they can hit you up, Max? At villainous underscore kind. Uh, Instagram and um, fucking Twitter. But don't bother. Um, I rarely <laughs> I rarely check it except when I'm drunk. So oh, okay. I, I'd either send it to Ono or the show. <laughs> yeah, you can check me out on uh, Twitter at this is Ono. That's it. This is O H N O. Same goes for Instagram. Oh, no. Yup. All right. Well, thank you again. Take it away, Annika. This has been a Neko Media podcast broadcasting from the Blood Cave, part of the slash tag Pollard family. Family? For myself, Annika Pussyfoot, Mox, and Ono, keep the lights on and check under that bed because there's only one universal truth. No lives matter. That means you. Stay rating, Wokeland. We have candy.